Hello, and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today, we're joined by Christopher Jacks, who has sales experience, not necessarily in a closing role, but has pre-sales experience. And I always love chatting with sales off people that know how to sell. Um, Chris is currently the Global Revenue Operations uh, Lead at OptiMove. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me. Pleasure um, to be here. So let's kick this off and try to understand why you left sales to join the ops team. Um. Even when I was in sales, I always had like an interest in like organization, like what was the best process that was going to help me achieve the results I needed. And I knew that lied in the data. So I ended up taking a few months off to do a little data science deep dive at General Assembly. I saw that. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well worth my time. Um, intense three months, but it definitely reshaped my thinking and gave me more tools um, leaving it. And so then I took that and. I immediately found Optimove. It was four blocks away, maybe two blocks away um, from my old office at Datarama. So it was not that big of a switch at all, still in the ad tech space. And um, yeah, after that, I then took on that sales ops role and then started, started serving the sales team in a different capacity. I, I'd like to dig a bit more into that. What can you share, and this might be hard, but something that you learn in the General Assembly data course that has helped you do something with the sales process that has added value? I mean, I can name like small things. Like I could run a Python script and scrape the um, event speakers. We're going to go to an event and then it's a part of our pre-event process. And then that goes into our CRM for then our pre-sales to outreach to schedule meeting for those events. And it's like those small things that save time do add up. And then if you build them to a regular process, they become easy. Uh, but I think mainly what the data science program taught me was like how to solve problems. So like when you have no guidance, like how do you then teach yourself to do something to then create it to add value? So that was our whole reporting and having to pull it out of SQL into Power BI to help, you know, the VPs and executives make decisions by visualizing it the right way. Got it. Um, awesome. Was the move after the General Assembly course, the move into OptiMove, was that your first sales ops role or did you have a sales ops role before that? That was my first sales ops role. Got it. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and just paint the picture for us a little bit at OptiMove, how many reps and how many people in the ops team? Um, I would say reps, including pre-sales and account executives. We have about... 10 in the U.S. office, 6 in the U.K. office, and 15 or so in the total view office. Got it. And then in the ops team, how many people do you have? The ops team, it's, I'm the only sales ops individual, and then we have a marketing ops individual, too, that's in Tel Aviv. Got and it. I'll report to VPs, they'll report to CMO. Together, that makes a revenue operations. Got it. Interesting. And so are you then, or if then, I guess account manager is part, if almost like customer service, right? So, no, sorry. When I say account exec, I just mean like a sales manager, someone who's quota carrying beyond just opportunities. Yeah. Got it. So is there any operations person supporting the reps or is that just like the customer support manager? Um, customer success is its own team in and of itself. I think it'll be me for like reporting. Um, in terms of like Slack integrations to help make things visible. But IT really sees to their Zendesk needs and in creating processes. But when it comes to like renewals and things like that, it's more I just surface that information for them. We haven't had too many processes built out with the customer success team. Got it. Cool. And then the current sales tech stack that you guys are running. Uh, we use HubSpot for our CRM, both sales and marketing. It's simple. Uh, Apollo, it's like uh, Sales Loft or like a Outreach IO. We use it for sales enablement. I like it because it has a B2B database in it, which has helped us move away from Zoom Info, which doesn't offer a lot to those with HubSpot, in my opinion, by way of like two-way integration real time. We use Gong IO, which we've had for probably like six months now, which has been great. It's for like sales intelligence. 
um, transcribes all the calls. You can set trackers. So you can surface all the questions of a call really quickly. Um, that was, that's been a game changer. And then we use Power BI for reporting. I'd say that's, those are the main ones. We heavily, um, we love Slack. We rely on Slack a lot. So we have cool like Zapier integrations where um, real-time track the deal process with new lines every time it moves stages. That's been a popular channel. Um, and then we have like some basics like sales nav. Our information is all sh stored in SharePoint. <clears throat> we just use Microsoft a lot. Um, but those are like the key pieces. I'd say the sales side, the sales side. Cool. Um, I mean, I bet the real time Slack channel for opportunity tracking is very popular with the sales team, right? Yeah, I had it. So when you move deals to close one, um, it was cool when it was a surprise because it actually had the person who closed it, their face on like a gift. And be like, congrats, they just moved to close one. So like fun things like that, you know, to like incentivize, it's like build processes with empathy. And yeah. yeah. Cool. Now, I, I, I know you shared like a mini example of something of how you use data in order to save some time for the reps. Um, is there like a larger macro thing you've done since you've been at Optimove that has moved the needle for rep productivity? For rep productivity? Um, I would just say how we intake leads. Uh, a lot of, we work together on building a lot of the workflows with marketing as well. Um, and the whole idea of like ABS and always becoming better aligned with marketing and what they deliver. Um, so, I mean, now in the U S our greatest source of opportunity is actually events. Um, but the way we were handling event leads before was it was just automated emails from marketing for every event lead and coming from sales and coming from other processes. I knew that like, that wasn't going to get you the response. So being able to just like, it was like first couple of months, just taking all that and saying like, hey, marketing can reply to all these, but also sales needs to get these as soon as possible so they can respond, create those one-to-one -one connections. Marketing and sales aren't saying the same thing, but they can be speaking at the same time. Was one of the first paradigm shifts I think I helped bring into the organization. Got it. And the theory here is that we have generated these valuable leads from an event, instead of just pulling them through some like marketing automation, you can actually distribute and allow salespeople to follow up one-on-one -on -one, in theory to get a better response rate and therefore more deals out of the event. Yeah, it's okay to be aggressive and sales does have some bandwidth here and there. Yeah. Got it. Uh, okay. It's okay to be aggressive. Agreed, totally agree. Especially when you have some events these days, in order to get an ROI, you do have to really try and bleed all the value from that event with like the, the amounts that some events are charging, right? And so I, I, I definitely have this pressure as well at Epstar. We, we yeah. for example, have been to every world tour in the last few years. And sales for fourth world tours are incredible events. Um, but you do have to maximize the value you get out of the back. And this is something that I should probably be doing is bringing the sales team more into that. Um, Awesome. Now on to the forecasting process. Are you involved? Are you responsible for forecasting sales or who, who does that? So I'll get a number handed down to me for what the revenue target is. And then I have to assign opportunity targets based off of that. Um, so usually I'll work down from the revenue based off like the average deal size. And then I'll look at the opportunities and where they came from and then the close rate per opportunity and then set a goal that way. Um, and then we kind of just like, we have like a weekly meeting on Friday and then like a Monday report that comes out. Just that also looks at the same time last period, how we're tracking to see if we're indeed going to actually reach what we plan to do. Um, but there's always like a projected amount in pipe, which is like one of those reports, you know, I worked on the CEO just to like, this is what he predicts or thinks will be in the pipe at any given time. Will this help us reach our goal at the end of the year? Um, but by way of forecasting, besides forecasting opportunities and whether we're on target for revenue goal, I'd say that that's the most forecasting we're doing right now. Got it. So you're actually responsible for setting individual targets for reps. That's not their manager. That's your role. Oh, no, I'm saying for the sources. So 
if our events team has to ha- create a certain amount of um, leads for an event, um, the MBA manager will know that she has to create 70 opportunities, but she has to then say, okay, each maybe rep has um, an opportunity to go above that. So I know I can reach that. That's how I'd say create the goals. Cool. Um, and then a quick note on remote working with a remote sales team. I assume in the past few weeks, you guys have gone pretty much completely remote. Has that changed yeah. how, how you work with the reps? Are you doing anything differently, different tools to ensure that they can remain effective? I mean, everyone is, as I said, I love Slack because everyone remains super active. Um, we have these like happy hours where people just sit on Zoom at the end of the day and kind of could talk about what they did. Um, just based off where my seat was anyway, I was already like, I could have been, you could be remote in the office, you know? So, and also, yeah, half the teams being remote, Tel Aviv and UK, not much has changed there. So I think it's just always being available and quick to answer the call and knowing that people can ask you questions and being reliable. So I guess, yeah, you guys were distributed anyway with the three courses. Um, yeah. so it wasn't too much of a too much of a shift and because you're heavy slack users anyway like that's still okay um awesome okay i'm going to put you on the spot here related to sales metrics now okay. if you could only measure one more metric for the rest of your sales of career which would you choose um number of emails responded oh interesting please elaborate i think that helps me determine like there there's activity it's not like fluff because even if it's negative like one no human would like bring that amount of negativity on themselves there, there has to be something positive in it and um like that activity is a precursor to more positive goals being met um i don't know rather than just like a revenue number which could just be one big deal Got it. So just to clarify, is that the amount of emails that a salesperson has sent that have been responded to? Yes. Got it. Okay. So it's basically a measure of engagement of how how much activity this salesperson is generating. Exactly. Yeah. Because you're, yeah, I, I think you're right about the negative thing. You're, the amount of negative emails you get will probably be like minimal compared to positive. And so your theory is that if this person is getting more people respond to them, that ultimately at some point in the future will lead to more deals. Yeah. Got it. So are you, are you tracking this right now? And are you, are you showing this to the reps if you are tracking this? Then? Yeah, I really like Apollo's dashboarding. So I guess he like touches per account, which I think is an interesting one as well. Because I think a lot of people at first are just like, okay, this one contact, focus on them. And then next it's like, no, it's not like wide, medium sized nets, you know, but um, yeah, number of emails responded is one I'm more service for the MBA manager. Uh, it's just a hub, sits as a HubSpot dashboard for the VP manager, but that's it. Got it. And I mean, I don't want to turn this into a pitch, but as to have this one feature that um, we call the engagement score, which measures both in and outward traffic for each rep or each opportunity, which is super interesting. Um, and yeah, like similar to you, we have a lot of people that say this is a very good leading metric for, for revenue. Um, Could it be at the company level? It, it would also be at the company level, yes. So, so that's so unique. Yeah, I don't opportunity know. account. Yeah. Um, but currently yeah. only integrates with Salesforce, so we, we won't be able to test it out with you guys, I'm afraid. Maybe one day. that before. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway. Um, okay, awesome. Final question. Who in the world of sales ops has most kind of influenced your journey to date? Um, I met this guy probably a year and a half ago. His name is Michael Ingram. He runs this company called sales ops. IO. it's like a consultantship for like small time um, sales ops role. And we've just regularly stayed connected and he's helped me rethink the position and like the value you can offer. Um, just by hearing of all the opportunities he's offered others and like just regularly staying in contact. So I'd offer people to look him up and, um, yeah, I would, I would say that's the one. If that's the I think, question. you know, I think I exchanged emails with Michael maybe, but yeah? like, we, we, we definitely haven't had him on. So he must have, 
Re- either oh, rejected me. Now. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, yeah, so he has to be now. And now, now you said so. I will reach out again. Um, awesome. Chris, thank you so much for your time here. Um, I'm just going to pull out a few things. I think your metric was very interesting. Normally we get, I think, probably more lagging indicators for that mm. in, in answer to that question. And so this is one that's very high up the funnel, um, which I think ops people can use to understand more about how rep is performing. Um, and then the other thing I have here is your point about <laughs> it's okay to be more aggressive, um, especially when you're trying to maximize and squeeze that kind of ROI from these high priced events. Um, so Chris, anything else you'd like to share? Any other gems you'd like to share with the audience before we close? I wish I had something prepared for this. <laughs> but, um, other than just stay safe. I don't know. <laughs> stay safe. That's, that's good all enough, I Chris. got. <laughs> Chris, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.